Hello team and welcome to another AT another ATP geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP but it's I'm not the only Jonathan in town there's a far more superior human being in the form of a Jonathan with me and that is indeed Jonathan Fink from Silicon Curtain so thank you for joining me Jonathan Definitely well I I'd say an inferior copy I mean I'm not going to take that compliment lying down <laughs> a cheap well, knockoff Jonathan yeah <laughs> Well, well, we have interacted before, both here and on uh, Silicon Curtain, Jonathan's YouTube channel, just to remind people of that uh, that fantastic uh, repository of superb interviews. We're going to start by talking a little bit about a recent interview, not with this bechopped person here, uh, although that was when my chops were a nice rosy colour of, of, of beautifully auburn. Uh, they are no longer that, unfortunately. But uh, uh, do, do you want to tell people, just give a brief, I know people will know who you are. Brief um, in, introduction to to what you do over at Silicon Curtain. Absolutely. So Silicon Curtain uh, established um, really a couple of months after the full scale invasion. Um, a little slow to get going, as you know, it, it takes time on YouTube. But basically, from about sort of mid um, 2022, been producing about a video a day on average, um, and um, now racked up. Uh, around uh, well we're coming up to almost 400 um podcasts plus weekly news sessions as well uh we do summaries of the news that's happening in ukraine russia um and uh, one of the reasons i mean people always ask especially ukrainians why on earth are you doing this there are many and multiple reasons i mean one of those is that i did live in Russia in the 90s um for an extended period studied the history studied the language and um feel that it's beholden on me to to share some of those insights um because people run around in a full-scale war how did this happen this is like how did no one predict this well there are certain people area experts who've been saying for a long time that this is going to happen and dare I say it, predicting what russia is going to be doing next and i think it's important to try and at least get some of that analysis out there well you recently spoke to the ubiquitous Ever present, uh, General Ben Hodges, who is everyone's favourite general. I think he's just I love listening to him. Uh, what in in that interview he talked about Crimea? Uh, he's often talked about Crimea. Arguably, got it wrong at, as many did in terms of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. You had General Zeluzhny saying they were going to make thirty kilometres a day. Uh, apparently, what what he was thinking, as we since found out, we've got Budinov saying we're going to get to Crimea. You had General Ben Hodges saying we're going to get to Crimea. You concentrated on your in your interview on this sort of subject of Crimea. Uh, what what did he have to say about that? I mean, considering I, that was a big old video as well, that you've got a lot of hits on that bad boy. It is. It's uh, and it's still going. I mean, this is this is the interesting thing about YouTube. Most of the interviews within forty eight hours, they're kind of done. And even though the content is designed to be, I wouldn't say evergreen, but essentially, I mean, the life cycle, I would say, of the content is is a lot more than forty eight hours. But this is how YouTube works, and it's extremely annoying. You know, the video will kind of drop out, and you'll get very very few views. Uh, outside of that sort of 48 hour kind of period on most of them. Uh, but the Ben Hodges one, it just uh, keeps trundling along because uh, he's he's searched for, he does a lot of media, he's extremely prominent. Um, and this is this is this is going to be the most successful video so far on the channel. It's heading towards half a million views, which is uh, wow. for a for an hour long piece of material, uh, quite sort of heavy material. I think it's uh, it, it's not too bad. Um, one thing that comes across with Ben is his humility. So mm. unlike certain Vatniks who we, uh, we we could mention, who stick with the same lies and keep pumping them out, uh, obviously Ben is extremely thoughtful and he examines his points of view. And of course, one of the things in the video is he holds his hand up and says, well, no, of course, they didn't take Crimea. We did talk about it. Let's analyze why that didn't happen. Um, and I think there there are some interesting ideas there. I mean, he wasn't involved in the war gaming that went on prior to the full scale, um, uh, not the full scale invasion, when, uh, prior to the counter offensive. Um, but there was war gaming done, assisted, of course, by the US and people who are expert in that. And one of the ideas is that some of the inputs um, to those calculations were just wrong and were extremely wrong. One of those was the underestimation of how Russia was fortifying its territories. Um, 
uh, not its territories, the, the churches that it was occupying. And it was thought that those would be relatively, you know, lightweight and incompetent. Um, much in the line of Russia's offensive capability have been shown to be fairly crude and, uh, and incompetent. Um, for instance, you know, we all remember the column uh, that was trapped outside Kiev and uh, how Ukrainians were able to take pot shots at that. I mean, we've seen extreme incompetence and corruption um, that, that, that ladder up to Russia not being a very competent uh, offensive force. Turns out in defense, they were far more competent than they were given credit for. So they created these incredible fortifications, um, plus the minefields. The minefields are what really sort of does it. Um, you know, despite the Western equipment, if you don't have command of the air, getting through those minefields while Russia does control the airspace, this is one of his main conclusions there. You know, that is that is one of the main reasons why it failed. But also, it was, a, it was a, there was this dilemma that happened, which is that people were pressuring Ukraine to do this springtime offensive. I mean, it seems so mm -hmm. long ago now, but the springtime in 2023, they're saying, right, this is, and they wanted to do it then because of, of that being a good time to start yeah. the ball rolling, but they didn't have the stuff. Uh, but at yeah. that stage, Russia weren't that well fortified. So it's like, do we attack now, but we're not prepared, but they're not prepared? Or do we wait like however many months and then? we are prepared but then they're prepared and actually yes. it may not have made any difference when they did it because there was this like differing level you know it was a uh, both sides getting prepared at the, at the same speed but it, it, it's a tricky one and of course what they're thinking of and one thing that uh, ben hodges is an expert at is logistics he talks about willie talks about logistics um and you know there clearly was um an over calculation of what ukraine would have in terms of equipment whether that was deliberate undersupply or not uh, is the big debate. And that debate has really erupted in the last couple of weeks as to whether the undersupply of Ukraine is a strategic decision or, you know, up until now, I think people have been given uh, Ukraine's allies the benefit of the doubt and put it down to, you know, political problems, uh, supply problems. and But now it seems there's 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 more design behind it than, uh, than, than, than accident. But it's quite clear they didn't have the right equipment and the war gaming presumed that they had a lot more of that capability than they did. It may well have also presumed a greater level of training. Now, certain units will have a reasonable level of training and, of course, will have extensive experience, but it is not consistent across all units. Uh, and the tactics and techniques, I believe, are not consistent you know, right across the unit. So, that also is going to be, you know, challenging. Be able to uh, maintain that consistency when you start pushing beyond uh, Russia's lines. And as Ben points out, you know, logistics are a big challenge. If you take a whole bunch of territory, you, you're always uh, at risk of, of outrunning your supply lines. Well, let's flip this around because this isn't something that Ben talked about, but it's something I've been chatting to about with uh, a military expert kind of offline. Now we see Russia. Um, on the ascendancy, one could say, uh, looking more confident, and suddenly panic sets in. Oh my goodness! You know they're gonna they're gonna take Kharkiv, they're gonna take Kiev, they're gonna roll over the whole of Ukraine. But it's been pointed out that the Russian army is not the same one uh, as it was before the invasion. A lot of their seasoned troops, a lot of their uh, specialist troops, were all wiped out in the early stages of the war. They have very few as a percentage of the overall army uh, of their original uh, professional force. So Russia might break through certain parts of the front line, but this military person was saying, well, what are they going to do next? They haven't got combined uh, arms uh, licked in any sense at all. Um, they don't have sort of highly trained officers. They don't have highly trained troops or even highly motivated troops. They may take a bit of ground, but how are they going to take extensive ground, build in the logistics, master combined arms in order to push further deep into Ukraine? It's just fanciful to think that they can uh, suddenly become, you know, this incredible offensive blitzkrieg force when in fact it's taken them sort of six months or so to take a relatively small sort of villages and, and hamlets. So I think we tend to swing between extreme optimism, which is unwarranted, and extreme pessimism. And we're definitely going through one of those troughs at the moment. Well, I, so I, 
It's interesting because I've spoken to people. I've spoken to people who have been on the ground and spoken to battalion commanders and so on and so forth. And there is a sense that this is really challenging time for for Ukraine and things are bad and they're going to lose Chazib Yar and they're going to, they, you know, the Russians are going to push west from Bakhmut and uh, there's a lack of ammunition and so on and so forth. But I'm actually far more optimistic at the moment. I think, for, you know, for the reasons you were just talking about, that I don't think the Russians can muster much of a combined arms uh, offensive towards the Ukrainians. And to do that, they're going to have to mobilise, but then there will be a dilution of their decent forces. And and yet the Ukrainians need to, to mobilise themselves and they need the equipment, but they've got 50 allies giving them stuff yeah it's never quick enough and it's you know it's never the right time but they are getting it to the to the tune of significant amounts of stuff uh, in a in a far more sustainable way than Russia are getting assistance and so when i'm looking forward i just think that ukraine are in a better position and always will be as long as that aid and that support is maintained and that's why i get worried about like the, the european elections coming up so i i don't know what what are you are you generally hopeful at the moment do you take those views as well well, it's, it's it's a terrible situation because what's quite clear is that without sufficient supply of munitions, um, there will be an extremely high cost in terms of Ukrainian lives. In fact, there already has been. Yeah. And this is why um, I perhaps get a little uh, overly emotional in these discussions now and overly personal as well. Um, Mention a figure like Jake Sullivan, who is uh, part of Biden's national security team and is clearly a pivotal figure in the strategy going back to the start of the war i gave it's him a also, bit of a rinsing this morning yes well he you know we we i did a i did a video on the channel back in january when uh, there not many people knew who he was um and and i you know i've really started to kind of aware that 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 he's a problem and uh trying to figure out how can you turn him from a problem into into a solution uh is that even possible is it too big a leap but he certainly seems to have been highly influenced by uh, Russia's coercive nuclear threats, their sort of blackmail and so on. You know, this is a key part of their propagandistic drive. And not just in the full-scale war, he seems to have been very much influenced by this. Um, uh, right right from the start, going back, I would say, to the reset and uh, Obama's, Obama's administration. I was about to call it a regime. No, definitely administration. Um, but he certainly has taken this to heart. So... I think in that mindset, every provision of supplies, every precision provision of a new capability is seen as escalatory. Whereas I think to you and I, and, and actually to the British and French mindset, we have seen now that the provision of scalp and storm shadow and incredibly dramatic strikes on uh, Russian targets in the Black Sea and so on, uh, there's been no consequences. This, this fear of escalation is largely hollow. Um, and if you take a sort of boiling the frog strategy, it seems this escalation ploy by Russia doesn't work. Yes, they will strike back and hit civilians. They will take vengeance actions, but not the escalatory ones that are uh, threatened. Um, so I think Macron, I think in London, that game uh, really is almost played out. But we don't have the capabilities, all the capabilities that Ukraine requires. But it does seem to be coercively controlling uh, Washington's actions. So, you know, we, we we talk about and we we overly imagine the capability of Russia and always have done. And going back through the entire war, I think many in the media over imagine Russia's strength and capability, which again is 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 a key part of their propagandistic narratives. If you analyze like Dzerzhinsky, in the 1920s, after the revolution, the Bolshevik regime was so incredibly fragile, and yet through uh, extraordinary espionage and propaganda, managed to convince the uh, Western powers that it wasn't. And so they, this, they've this used all happened as well. all the way through. Yeah, this happened as well. Uh, was it the 50s, 60s, where mm -hmm. I've just been watching, as I said on your uh, interview of me, I've been watching Turning Point, uh, the Cold War documentary on on Netflix and they were talking in there that at one point during the, the early stage of the Cold War, the this bravado and disinformation campaign projected by the Russians meant that the, the, the Americans thought they had way more nuclear missiles than they actually did. And in, in and, and they did they got their spy plane to go over, the U-2 spy plane. It turns out they're only like three 
literally three uh, nuclear warhead you know, missile launches or whatever, something something along those lines. And it was just a vastly uh, overestimated situation. And it's like we haven't learned from that. We're still afraid of the Russians to the point where it, it, it changes our strategizing. And that is a success for the Russians. They have they have won in that information space. Uh, absolutely. I mean, they invented this concept of fake it until you make it. I mean, uh, that is the definition of the Potemkin village, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it's literally you fake reality. Um, and if you fool enough people, they, you get away with it. And it goes all the way back to the uh, fragile beginnings of the of the Bolshevik regime. So rather than imagining, you know, Russian strength or Ukrainian strength and overemphasizing both of those, I think what has happened is I say across the Western allies, but actually it's principally, uh, I think the, the US is driving this sort of fear of escalation. What we've done is try to match Ukraine, Ukrainian strength with Russian weakness. I think there's been a definite policy to say, okay, let's just incrementally supply to maintain some kind of status quo, maintain a kind of balance so that Russia doesn't literally kind of collapse suddenly and we saw an inkling of of, of what might happen uh in uh Kherson and Kharkiv of course when they took huge swathes of territory now at that point they decided not to press on um again because of lack of supply lack of ammunition lack of preparedness of those logistics and of course they were retaking territory that then bumped up against sort of natural defensive lines you know rivers etc um and features in the land that made it easier to defend so there's some logic to sort of you know stopping and, and consolidating those gains but it gave us an inkling of how quickly russia could collapse now i think if ukraine was provided with an overabundance of munitions, um, then Ben Hodge's prediction about uh, Crimea uh, could be correct. Uh, and they could have taken large states of the territory um, to the point where Russia would have perhaps been forced um, either to negotiate or retreat or some kind of internal event would have been triggered like Prigozhin's coup. So there seems to be this eternal balance of, of limiting Ukrainian strength and trying to match it to Russian weakness. The trouble is we overestimate Russian strength on the one hand, and then we swing the other way. And we overestimate their weakness sometimes as well. And we overestimate or we underestimate their capability to inflict brutality. Yes, because at the end of the day, they can still fling a whole bunch of missiles and shahids and things from a distance. And they have a, a, a tendency to throw men and equipment ad infinitum almost at the Ukrainians to make those gains. And you kind of underestimate their ability to, to soak up deaths and losses to just phenomenal levels that we would mm -hmm. never endure in, in with nato uh moves so maneuvers so it yeah uh, exactly but what does um ben hodges think about crimea now then because he's got this thesis about crimea going forward well i, I did sort of slightly put the uh, the phrase into his mouth i have to admit there this this idea of siege of crimea because right. he was describing this sort of scenario of what you do next but essentially you know it's it's not um conceivable because of the defensive positions and you know you'd have to mount a you know amphibious kind of landing uh it, it's just not doesn't seem feasible to use um mass conventional forces to retake crimea and i think he absolutely you know agrees with that however if you can harry their logistics and supply lines uh you can um you can you can you can take out the kirch bridge which which in fact has already happened it's already yeah. no longer being used for mass military transport because of the strikes that have already taken place and the threat of further strikes but they are building a rail line now if you have long-range attack and taurus etc it makes the entire area untenable. Uh, I mean, Crimea, as he pointed out, and as uh, another speaker on the channel, um, Andrew Mitchell pointed out, um, Crimea is already a burden uh, for Russia. Um, its Black Sea fleet cannot operate from it. Therefore, its raison d'etre militarily has disappeared. It's no longer a, a, uh, a fortress from which to operate. The 
radar stations, communication stations, airfields have been hit repeatedly. There's no inch of that territory which is safe um, from Ukrainian strikes. Uh, so militarily, it's already a, a dead duck, as it were. The water supplies are cut off. So agriculturally, it's fully dependent on Russia. It can't grow its own food. And the domestic agricultural industry is like essentially shot to pieces until it can be reunited and integrated um, in a united Ukraine where they start to you know rebuild the infrastructure. It's also questionable as to how long that might take. Could be could be years, could be, could be decades. Um, and also economically, it predominantly relied on tourism for its economy. Well, that that kind of doesn't really yeah. exist now. Um, so it's it's a massive kind of white elephant at the moment. It's just they're clinging on to it for purely political rather than economic and strategic reasons. If you start to take out the logistics lines, then then it will it will essentially uh, uh, it, it will starve. And the, it's, the, it's the, a really the... difficult place for the Russians to effectively hold on to, to or to to use it practically. To it, the Ukrainians uh, can make it untenable for the for the Russians. I've long said this, and and actually Ben Hodges said this even while he was uh, espousing sort of taking it in a military uh, sort of way he was also as it was changing on the battlefields he was saying well actually you can just make it untenable for the russians as you were just saying there in in, in the interview with him you know when you've only got three points of entrance to 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 the peninsula yeah Henichesk at perakrot and uh, um in in the and over here as well uh, no uh, in the middle here sorry uh, chonha Chonha, Henichesk, and Perakrot. Then you can just hammer those places. Jankoy is a, is a crucial logistics hub. And then if you can make the Kerch Bridge also very difficult to use, which apparently they can't actually use it for heavy military traffic still, then it, then at what use is, is Crimea? It becomes a launching pad for Shahids, which I think is still a problem. But essentially, the, as you said, the Black Sea Fleet has had to move to Norozysk. That's a win for the Ukrainians. And I think we, we don't... Uh, it, it frustrates me the mainstream media doesn't doesn't celebrate that enough. So when you see the sinking of these ships or the hitting of these ships in Sevastopol, the mainstream media gives it scant regard. And yet when you have these huge, well, you know, when Avdivka falls, the mainstream media is all o over it. So that's frustrating. Does that frustrate you in the same way? It, there's a complete imbalance. And here I have to call out, uh, you know, this is this a... Uh, this is a fairly typical behaviour, I guess, of, 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 of uh, you know, hardened Tories. Let's bash the BBC. But actually, some of the headlines in the BBC covering Ukraine have been shockingly bad. Yeah, okay. um, when, let's say, I think it was the uh, Novichirkask was taken out, you know, rather than, it's, this is a military target, uh, this is a ship that potentially uh, has been involved in the death of hundreds of Ukrainians, hundreds uh, from, you know, launching missiles, etc., enabling Russian aggression. Um, it's hit. Yes, the sailors on board, but it's an offensive piece of military kit. And the line is Ukraine hits ships, you know, 65 dead or something. It makes it seem like Ukraine is the aggressor from those kind of headlines. Doesn't focus on the strategic value, strategic importance. Indeed, the improbability and what Ukraine has to go through uh, in terms of its inventiveness and its ingenuity to actually achieve this strike and carry it out successfully. No, it concentrates on the headline almost to turn Ukraine from being a victim to an aggressor. And um, it's extremely weak. Similar one over the weekend on, on an airfield. You know, Ukraine hits airfield deep in Russia, 12 dead. It's like, that's not the story here. And, and why are yeah. you positioning it as, yeah. as that? It's really interesting. And th this is a problem right across mainstream media. And the same thing happened when the cargo plane was hit, the Il-76 in Belgorod. And it, the Russians then claimed it had loads of, of prisoners of war on, POWs. And all the mainstream media outlets were reporting that as as from what the Russians were saying, without going to what the Ukrainians were saying. And then open source intelligence people like myself were looking at all the data points going, well, that's not physically possible that that we could have been the POWs in terms of all the data that we found. And then later you saw the headlines get changed and, and the rhetoric slightly adapted, but, but they initially went, all of them initially went with what Russia was saying. And you're like, that is not good. 
and it's it's not learning the lessons of that. We have the same thing with the uh, Kohovka Dam explosion, mm. and within a few hours of it coming out, there was seismic information. Mm. I think from the Baltics that was heavily suggesting that this this isn't something that collapses naturally, doesn't produce those kind of sonic waves. Mm. It has to be a huge detonation. Yesterday, I just saw on social media uh, a video that Russians took, you yep. know, laughing and giggling as the thing exploded. You know, they they've clearly just come away from the the chambers that have uh, that have been ex uh, you know destroyed, uh, and they're you know they're filming their handiwork. Well, there was enough evidence within hours of that happening, and in fact, rather than saying, "Oh, we don't know who's to blame," you can say, "Okay, well here are, here are the possibilities," and it, not what this is what Russia said about it, but you can put it in context. Russia has a almost hundred percent track record of lying, of manipulation. So at least put it in some kind of context for audience. But no, let's report the uh, direct words of a genocidal terrorist regime without any context. I mean, it's it's epically weak. Of course, if you then put out an apology, if you then put out an update to the story, which unfortunately most didn't, um, Damn it, you were doing done. that weeks later. You're done and everyone's moved on. You know, that's not how news or social media works in this day and age. Yeah, that's really frustrating. And and there was so much evidence, annoyingly, about the Kokovka Dam is that the, the Russians had admitted they mind it. Like one of the units had on open, had released on Telegram or whatever, videos of them talking about mining it like months before, literally months before. And then yeah. and then, and then more stuff came out afterwards. Just, yeah, it's, it's and there's really no discussion of the strategic purpose. Again, mm. you know, there, there may be uh, things that happen like the explosion in Moscow that may be a sort of organic mm event that is not orchestrated but there is a history of things being orchestrated and eventually the purpose comes out eventually you piece it together and you realize okay well this was the sequence of events this is what happened and this is why it happened all of those conjectures could be examined at the time but they're but they're not you know we have this with mh17 as well mm. um and there are numerous incidents there and there also, you find, patterns in propagandistic behavior. If they come out with a dozen stories almost immediately, you just have to look at the scale and preparedness of the propaganda smokescreen, and that is almost the surest sign. So I know people who, who build software, who analyze the patterns around this, and you can fairly well tell whether it's an organic event by the sources of news how they build up how they amplify and how the narrative forms and then gets distributed um when you have an event which is orchestrated and that kind of stuff prepared in advance it has a very very different pattern of origins and amplification and normally you get multiple narratives emerging at the same time but from non-organic let's say sources so that's really interesting. So actually, it's probably more accurate if we ask ChatGPT or we say, Alexa, who really blew up the dam? Like straight afterwards and say, well, I've now analysed the probability and I can tell you straight off the bat, uh, JP, that it's it, it that it's almost certainly Russia. And yeah, so what is what's going on here then? If if like, are we okay? Rewind. So, is there enough about Russian and Soviet history? that we should be learning from but we're forgetting that should be informing us of the present behavior of the russians and why is it that we are not and by we i guess i mean uh, our politicians and our mainstream media why is it that we we are we are not just seeing that history is very closely rhyming with 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 previous instances throughout throughout mm. you know the past 100 years um i mean this is a question I've asked over and again to many experts, and I had a great uh, conversation with Nigel Gould uh, Davies, uh, a, a former British uh, ambassador to Belarus yesterday. Last week, uh, spoke to Ben Hodges and Andrew Mitchter. And combine this together, you get some interesting answers. And I think it's not just the media, it's not just politicians, because where politicians have the will to do something, they will then expend the energy and they will put risk in order informing their populations 
of why they've come to a certain point of view. Then the media follows along. So I don't think we take the media first in this instance. Yes, there's lots of inherent systemic weaknesses in the media, but essentially we're talking about the lack of will of politicians. So then we have to examine, well, what kind of politicians do we have? What system brought them about? Why have we got um, a preponderance of manager skills amongst our politicians as opposed to leadership skills? Uh, if we compare to other points in history, well, that's decades of, of relative, uh, you know, plenty and comfort almost certainly sort of brings that about. Um, and then you have to look at who is um, who is informing those politicians. And I think it's very interesting to look at the change in Macron's behaviour and his words and the fact he's willing to take huge political risks in saying that we need to have French boots on the ground, we need to deliver a lot more equipment, we need to, you know, dip our hands into our pockets, commission weaponry, this is going to cost you, the French people, but this is why it's incredibly important. Now, there's going to be some self-interest in there. There already is with, there always is with politicians. Mm. Similarly with Boris Johnson at the start of the war. Oh, again, yeah. He took huge political risks in doing what he did, um, despite the fact that I generally don't agree with anything else he's ever done. But he took a huge political risk in doing what he did there. And he explained it in, surprisingly for Boris, fairly clear language without the usual, um, you know, verbal, verbal fluff. Um, and then you have to ask, well, why are they doing this? Why have they gone out on a limb? And why are they not delivering uh, munitions or doing something to tick the box to say, yes, we've done it? I think I, I get the impression quite a lot of the German stuff, even though it's at scale, a lot of it's done like uh, we've, we've, you know, we've got a debt, we've got to do it, it's an obligation. They're not necessarily delivering based on a strategy. I think that's the key difference there. Boris was delivering based on a strategy and France is starting to think strategically about what Ukraine needs, not just well, what can we give it and tick the box. And there's an interesting, on. there are so many moving parts to, to this whole geopolitical uh, machine, the machinations here. And one of them for France will be what's going on in the Sahel region of Africa and the coups and Russia's influence there. And so I think France has many reasons to uh, to do what they are doing, as well as, you know, seeing their place in, in Europe, seeing Europe's place in the world. Uh, is, this is an EU strategic or EU strategy as much as a France strategy. And then looking at en uh, energy independence, but um, security independence, and then looking at the US and trying to move away from the US's sphere of influence and so on and so forth. So lots of stuff going on. Definitely. And looking uh, at the US, uh, essentially, um, having systemic problems, you know, I mean, to all those who say, oh, but it's MAGA, oh, but it's this. Uh, it, it seems to be a systemic problem within the US system. It's it's retreat or withdrawal from being involved in world affairs and being cautious in a way that it wasn't at any point in the Cold War. You know, the lack of will to um, defend values and I would say the lack of sound decision making. So again, then you have to look at well, what who's advising? And, uh, you know, some of those recent speakers made a very good point that, you know, you and I listen to a lot of the area specialists, people who are really deeply versed in Russian history and behavior, it's colonial behavior, USSR and so on, they don't always get it right. But at least you're immersed in those details of local mindset and behavior, because no two dictators are alike, no two situations are alike. And extrapolating out and trying to abstract these out often is uh, not that helpful. But it seems that a lot of the people who are actually advising politicians are, are generalists. They are working from, I would say, top down from conceptual uh, models of international relations and then applying it to these local situations and then wondering why it doesn't work, wondering why the situation is out of control and not being finally managed in the way they expect it to be. Um, the challenge is that a case is, of uh, yeah. like that? Does that generalization come from a projection of what? Well, if I was in that situation, this is what I would do rather than saying, Well, I it's it's this is Russia or this is a Soviet yeah. legacy, and these are Russian people that with their own individual or well, their own cultural legacy and history, and they will make yeah. decisions that are different to you as a rational actor. Uh, this is exactly the case, it's, it's a mixture, it's uh, projecting your own values and limits of behavior. Um, it's also looking at other cases. So you may be looking at, you know, other dictators, other situations, other invasions and wars and say, well, this is what happened in other situations. This is how those ended, etc. But again, 
I don't think it's looking at the right models. You know, they may be looking at the wars of the 20th century, regional wars, wars between ind individual countries like Iran, Iraq, etc. Not realizing that the local factors here are very, di very different. What you've got here is the largest uh, land, one of the largest land-based empires in history, uh, if not the largest land-based empire in history, third, I think third or fourth largest empire in history, and it's in the process of collapsing. Not only is it collapsing, it's ruled by, you know, the, the, the offspring of the KGB and the SS. I mean, quite literally, it's ruled by a sadistic mafia elite. Um, imagine Germany. I use this example. Imagine if the whole of Africa was a single country. And imagine if it was run by the SS. Imagine how horrific that would be and how outraged we'd be by that and the, the misery and slaughter that would give rise to. Well, hello, that is Russia. That's what it is. It's, it's interesting because Russia seems to be, on the one hand, losing influence in really important parts of the world for, as far as it's concerned, Armenia, Kazakhstan are two places that I think, oh, they're, 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 they've lost out there. Uh, Georgia, they are trying to get Georgian Dream, the, the ruling party, very much in their sphere of influence and move them away from uh, trying to accede to the EU, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then in other parts of the world, they're succeeding in gaining influence, say Africa, say some, some parts in the global south. And so this is really interesting time. You know, it's horrific and there's war. But, but in terms of like trying to work out where Russia is and how it's doing in certain areas, is, is like they're succeeding to a large degree in fomenting discord and dissent in European politics and disunity in the EU. And so there, there are like gains here and losses there. And I'm trying to, on balance, trying to see where, where Russia is. Uh, and yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts there? Do, do you think Russia is in a, in a strong, in, well, I can't think you could argue it's in a stronger place than it was, but what, what are your thoughts? It's certainly not, uh, you know, from our rational, economically rational point of view, it's certainly not in a stronger place. It is, going back to the start of the conversation, not only willing to burn up its population in a war and an aim and objective that seems pointless to us, it is willing and very actively burning up its entire economy and resources to an extent, again, we hadn't anticipated or thought was possible. Well, again, the experts hadn't thought was possible. Uh, whereas if you study Putin, you'll realize that, no, I mean, he, he, this, this is entirely possible. In fact, it's likely, and we should have been planning for that. The question is, is there any limit to to what he's willing to burn up? And I, I honestly don't think there is. So on the one hand, he is willing to, um, uh, you know, th there is no cap. You know, you could see a million Russian dead. Will he stop at a million? I don't think there is any number at which he will stop. The only point at which he'll stop is when he physically cannot fight anymore, when the losses start to threaten his regime and the foundations of regime, that's when he will stop. Before that, you know, everything, everything is uh, grist for the mill. But what you're seeing in Africa, I think, is another process which we've barely recognized. And if you studied, studied sort of 19th century history of the scrabble for Africa and this huge imperial greed and the extreme brutality that led to uh, anyone who's read Red Kondrag's Heart of Darkness and so on will, will sort of get a sense of, of how awful this sort of rapacious colonialism could be. But what you're seeing is a 21st century Russian version of the Scrabble for Africa. They couldn't do it in the 19th century when Western powers were at their peak militarily, industrially. Uh, it tried to take on Japan and lost disastrous in 1905. And that put pay to its overseas maritime imperial ambitions through the Soviet Union. It was able to project power, uh, not through directly uh, you know, taking over governments, but through uh, alliances and through projecting, you know, the communist ideology and so on. So through influence, partnership, and in many cases, you know, uh, cultural and educational bribes, um, uh, getting people from, from various, um, you know, leftist regimes to come study and live in Moscow. And that's where a lot of the goodwill comes from. We're not seeing that kind of... Uh, I, dread to, to, to pronounce the word Soviet Union as being benign, because it certainly wasn't benign. But compared to what Putin's doing, it was relatively benign. What you've got now is a mafia business enterprise that is using the techniques of 19th century imperial colonialism 
and that has perhaps retained the mindset of uh, of a sort of dark ages mongol horde um people might think that is an extremely uh, you know racist and pejorative sort of thing to say but you have to look at the actions you have to look at the origins of the political actions and techniques that are in place and they predate the enlightenment they predate the renaissance they predate um Roman Greek civilization, they harken back to, I think, a much darker age, but they're also using the tools of various ages that came after. You know, they're using technological tools, informational tools of other ages, 19th century imperialism and 20th, 21st century informational manipulation. But you have to look what underlines it. It's it's really primitive and dark. It's, it's interesting you use the word brutality then. Uh, that's where I want to go to next. Before I do so, I just want to give a, a few thanks out to uh, to people here. Um, I just uh, Before I do a thanks, talk about news sources. Uh, and Aussie Bugger here says, I'd never had any social media accounts until this war when I decided I had to add my voice. That's one of those positive things there about social media. Someone actually I'm said, with him no. on that. Yeah I, yeah, I went on to Twitter on 24th of February, 2022. I didn't have a Twitter account until then. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that's so important. Like We're fighting. We are, all of us are fighting in the information space. I keep saying this, but we are in a war with Russia. We are in the war with nefarious, uh, insidious actors in the information war. Um, David L here says people such as yourself, both of us and others are my primary sort of news source. There is barely any news coverage in the US me media regarding Russia, the Russian war on Ukraine. And I think that, that you know, the US is a big country. It has a lot of uh, things going on internally, domestically. And that's why it often looks in rather than out in terms of news media. And you can understand that. Uh, but there there's needs to be a place for Ukraine. I think it's so important what's going on. Uh, but just before we get to, to talk about uh, brutality and whatnot um stop the carnage thank you so much i can't keep up there's here's a generic hello to all the atp team members and those who should join our team thank you john and john uh punch that like and subscribe couldn't say it better myself uh, stop the carnage i appreciate that uh finish guy i would love to give more but i'm poor no thank you so much for your support yeah, and and just being here in the live chats and 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 subscribing is, is an insane so thank you very much jerko says the good will prevail from sweden i hope that is the case and that's what you know myself jonathan i'm sure and all of us who who are here interested in the war but also morally aligned with with ukraine really really hope um and to ronnie Franken, thanks mate uh, there goes my beer money for today i really appreciate that i don't want to make it to london I'll, I'll get him a beer you know just make up for it yeah there you go yeah yeah beers on me if we ever meet um uh richard bennett thanks for your atp geopolitics and memberships as ever richard thank you uh and jerko again ronnie Franken, come here and you will have unlimited supply of beer well there you go uh the, 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 there's a, a a warming um, uh, sentiment. Right. So not a warming sentiment is brutality. So you mentioned brutality and this idea that Russia really are re reinventing themselves in a, in a more brutal manner at the moment. But I often wonder about this idea that we tar, and I think I spoke to you about this before, actually, but hey, let's go over old ground. The idea that we tar a whole nation with a very broad brush and we say Russians are this and Ukrainians are that. And sometimes I have to check myself because I think, mm, I'm not sure that, that we're justified all the time in doing that. But are we justified in saying that Russians are a particular way or that the Russians are, are brutal by point of fact that we can look back through history and say, well, every time they've got themselves involved in conflicts like this, they are just insanely brutal and not just brutal to other people, but brutal to their own. Indeed, they, they just willingly send people to the meat grinders and to their mm -hmm. deaths. And, and there's a history of that. What, what can we learn from history about who they are now? Well, this is a, this is very much a nature nurture thing, isn't it? Because yeah. there's um, I think Russian propaganda loves to convince Russians that democracy is not possible in their country. That's one of the central planks of internal Russian cultural indoctrination is that, yeah, that might be all very well for the West. That might be all very well for, you know, but well, they'll say that Ukraine doesn't really have it. It's not real. It's, you know, it's invented, but it's not going to work here because, you know, we're unique, we're exceptional, we're this, that and the other. 
Russians will also understand that there's a counterpoint to that. You know, being unique, unique and exceptional sounds like quite a positive thing. But there's another side to it in that most Russians will have studied the history of the, the, the Civil War. They'll know what happened and, and how extraordinarily violent um, the Civil War period was in Russia. And they'll also have an idea in the 90s of how, um, I won't even call it capitalism, but sort of bandit, mafia control of the economy, um, what that looked like. You know, in terms of the daily shootings and outrages and the cemeteries, I'm a walk through them in the 90s, cemeteries full of freshly dug graves of people in their 20s and teens uh, who are essentially, you know, uh, business people and uh, entrepreneurs and low level mafia all, all, all being wiped out and their businesses taken over by rivals. So people have a memory that, you know, we're exceptionally unique, but also when things go bad, they go incredibly bad so that they, they, they have that in mind um but nature or nurture well there's nothing genetically about russians that mean that uh, uh, you know they, they can't become democracies and we see that many russians who go abroad and live in other societies um work and function extremely well within uh, rules-based systems um and uh, they're not all oligarchs. There are many uh, Russians who go, and they may not be uh, that active in active in civil society and, and, and politics, so on. But they go and they they live uh, constructive um, lives uh, in the societies, and they they fit in very well with rules based orders. Um, but the situation in Russia is different, and you have both programming. Uh, you have the the, the regime uh, and and all its exponents who have built a uh, education system and an informational space that is designed to weaponize culture, weaponize traditional values, weaponize everything they get their hands on to increase the level of kind of aggression, hatred, sense of victimhood, othering people. They, they take everything that's worst in yeah. humanity and they manipulate it. So first of all, Russians are living in that toxic environment of extreme manipulation. And let's face it, if you were to place uh, most Westerners in that, and this unfortunately is the case, in extreme coercive environments, you have to have an incredible mental resilience to to be your own person and to question everything you're told. And let's face it, you know, the majority of any population doesn't do that. Even in our society, um, people tend to shy away from the really hard, hard task of questioning everything, including their beliefs. So that's but, one layer. Yeah. Well, actually, just just on that. Um, sorry to interrupt, but just to. It's uh, it's interesting that you mentioned sort of grievance. The grievance narrative, I think, is really important for for the Russians because their own population is not having like a great time of it. Like there are elements of improvement in in quality and standard of life for some Russians in the elite circles, but when you look across the whole of of Russia and the, and the standards across all these different regions things aren't great and if you've got that much money flowing through russia from the hydrocarbons you've got more millionaires this year than ever from russia and there are billionaire oligarchs that are creaming off the off the state effectively creaming off the, the the natural resources of the country that should be reinvested in the country then you you need to like you've got to blame someone because they don't seem to be able to blame Putin. And so therefore it has to be the West's fault. It has to be someone else's fault that is doing, that is keeping them suppressed in, in the way that they appear to be. Sorry. Well, you certainly, you can, you can weaponize that narrative. Um, you know, I, I try to, 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 to fish back to my memory of the nineties when things were generally quite bad in the cities. And I would almost argue possibly less bad in the countryside than it is now, uh, mainly because the contrast is now so extreme. And of course, the cities have, have, have picked up in terms of uh, their material existence. Uh, the wages picked up. Up until 2012, there was extraordinary wage growth in the major cities. Um, but what's been created is this, 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 um, this weaponization of grievance and almost not an exaggeration of the 90s but saying okay it was really bad but not rationally dissecting that and saying yes and there's complex reasons behind that and this is how you know we're going to fix it no it's about saying okay it was really bad it was actually far worse than you remember it and somebody was to blame you know it didn't have to happen and it's not us so it's the avoidance of any kind of historic responsibility it's the avoidance of the hard task of imagining you know um 
uh, piecing together the past and the, the difficult things about the past and saying, well, this is, you know, partly even where to blame uh, for it. Uh, it's much easier to project that out onto others. And that's partly why it's been so successful. Um, and of course, Ukrainians do examine their past, and they've done that both on a historical and societal level, and they do it through their families as well, because there isn't a single family that hasn't undergone some kind of trauma at the hands of the Soviet Union and Russia. Um, and people examine that openly, and it's a painful thing to do. That happened in Russia in the 90s, and then people put a lid on it. It's like, well, this is too painful. This is too hard. This is too difficult. And what Russian propaganda has done is provide a kind of convenient uh, amnesiac uh, to say, okay, well, you don't have to think about this stuff anymore. You don't have to take any responsibility for it. We'll tell you what to do. We'll absolve you from the hard, painful task of taking responsibility of being an individual um, and, and we'll, we'll do all that for you. That partly answers one of the questions of why we don't see uh, mass political protest and why so many people um, seem willing to uh, go to their deaths. It's not because they believe all the lies, but it's because those lies are convenient. Uh, I mean, you might find, but say, well, hang on a second, dying is not particularly convenient. Uh, <laughs> being blown to smithereens is not convenient. But I think, you know, we're, we're, we're not rational in that sense. Uh, and, and, and Russians, in some ways, are brought up to be, this is going to sound awful as well, less rational. Because to live in the Soviet Union, you had to compartmentalize your mind. You had to pronounce absurdities in one context and hide your true sense and feelings. Mm. And then you had to allow them to come out in another setting, let's say a familial setting, um, family environment, you may even have to do that selectively with certain relatives because you might have relatives and members of the party who are, um, you know, HR directors or whatever, or members of the KGB, low level. So you have to be different things to different people all the time and uh, compartmentalize, your, compartmentalize your mind. What that means, and Peter Pomerantsev talks about this much more eloquently than I can, what it also means is that that mentality allows you to hold different ideas in your head, ideas that are absolutely contradictory and mm. make literally kind of no sense. And I think Putin's propaganda is using that compartmentalization to get people to believe and go along with things which are absolutely absurd. And one part of their mind can accept that it might be absurd. Another part it, it, it can, can, can accept it and embrace it. And uh, it doesn't seem rational to us, but it's uh, a form of programming. He's so good at uh, sowing, or the Kremlin so good at sowing confusion, and then sort of, you know, I guess people can pick out, out from that what they want, um, and then also, you know, the Kremlin can find out what some people think and throw out all sorts of different, you know, different threads, and then get 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 to react to them. But I I, I interrupted you. That you yeah. said you were going to go on to a second. There's a second point, and this is trauma. This is generational trauma. And you said, are Ukrainians different from Russians? And I think there is a fundamental difference. You know, you will get things like domestic abuse in every society. You will get drunken brawls and unpleasantness and people being generally horrid to each other. But the sheer scale of that and the intergenerational scale of that in Russia is is on another level. And, you know, if you spend any considerable time there, you will kind of see it. And you will see it in many, many interactions, not just of people who are physically abusive, but people who are abusive of each other. You know, you, you go into shops and the, the shopkeepers might be abusive towards you. Um, you might have shoppers shouting at each other, people on a bus yelling at each other. The general level of... Uh, I would say, sort of trauma that comes out in terms of projections, in terms of violence, verbal, physical violence, psychological violence, is, is on an extremely high level. And whereas many societies try to deal with that in some way, uh, democracies uh, are able to evolve processes that at least try to keep a lid on that, at least try to tackle it in some kind of way, and they're not entirely successful. But in a totalitarian regime like Russia, where that nascent trauma actually benefits you because it stops people organizing against you. 
there's actually an incentive to not treat the trauma, but to exacerbate it, to exaggerate it, to then utilize it. And I think that's the other really pernicious aspect we see of uh, of the way Russia operates. And it's little, really not realized enough. You know, we see the brutality on the surface. We don't realize that that reflects an extreme deep level of brutality and distrust between people as well. Whereas Ukrainians um, are on a journey, you know, they've they've all emerged from the Soviet Union, but I think there was already uh, stronger social and cultural bonds in Ukraine, certainly in the West of Ukraine um, in 1991. And that has only increased, it's increased under pressure of Russian assault, but it's also increased as Ukraine as society has been devolving power from the center down into the regions. And when you give people more responsibility, rather than creating chaos, it seems to create more cohesion and more trust. Um, at least that is the learnings from Ukraine. So they're in a very opposite path, I think, of development. Yeah. And it's not just political. You can you can dig right down like a stick of rock and find that difference at every single layer, right down to individual apartment buildings, stairwells, streets, villages, etc. Yeah, and I just get a sense of that from like just when you see uh, snapshots into Ukrainian cities and lives and then compare that to the snapshots you see on the socials in, into Russia. I know it's, it's po possibly a lot of selection bias going on, but and when I look at the, some of the troops and, and, and some of the Ukrainian troops and the Russian troops, I just think, these are two, there, there are two different things going on here. And it's, it's that there's so much I can derive intuitively from these snapshots into different societies. It's, it's really yeah. interesting. Sorry, just a little sidebar here. United We Ride says New Zealand has a classic example of that with Once Were Warriors. So he's talking about the brutality and generational brutality. And if, if anyone, just a random aside, if anyone gets a, gets a chance to watch Once Were Warriors, it's an absolutely phenomenal, I just got shivered down my spine. It's a brutal film. Temerera Morrison in that does a, a, a job of showing brutality within domestic relationships and i would give you the rendition of the famous line but it's a bit sweary but it's cook me some bleep eggs bleep um very good film anyway but it's it's pretty emotional and hard uh, anyway there's that kind of brutality in that in that moldy um societies that, that you see that brutality all throughout russian society in many different ways uh so given what you've just been talking about then jonathan do you think that uh, what do you think of people's approach or different countries' approaches and, and political approaches to appeasement, given that there is this kind of level of uh, political violence um, and brutality with Russia? What, what does that say about our willingness to, to appease that? Yeah. Well, Macron, I think, is starting to go in the right direction. And I think uh, actions like the uh, strikes against um, the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol using Storm Shadow is correct. You need to show willingness to, you know, to put up a barrier. You need to have red lines and you need to show a willingness to enforce them. Uh, Russia does respond, I think, to deterrence and <clears throat> Putin above all does. So there's this story. I think about when he cornered a rat, um, which Keir Giles tells in one of our interviews with, with uh, uh, again, you know, extraordinary panache. And everyone takes the story out of this that, you know, Putin tells this about the rat, that he corners a rat and the rat goes kind of super aggressive. And everyone says, aha, this is what Putin's like. He's like the cornered rat, ignoring the rest of the story that Putin ran away from the rabid rat. That's the moral of the story here, is that if you show will, determination, and an insuperable barrier to Russia, they don't go crazy. They're not, they're not insane. They don't nuke the whole world. They think, okay, well, we're not going to advance in this direction. Let's try something else. Let's go round it. It's a bit like sort of water. It will try to find another way to percolate through with its force and aggression. It might ramp up in Africa. If it fails in Ukraine and gets pushed out, they won't burn down the world. They'll probably invade Central Asia or Armenia or something else, which is terrible in and of itself. Um, but this, this, I think, is how it works. The other reaction is people will you know, say, OK, if we go too far, Putin's going to sort of, you know, lose it and uh, et cetera. What, what does an abuser do? 
what does an abuser do when you know he's in a pub situation and he realizes that the guy he's just sort of uh, you know spilled the pint of or, or challenged to a fight is bigger and tougher than him? Well, he probably runs away and then goes and beats up his 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 wife or someone who's weak, someone who he can manipulate, someone who he can exert force over. And this, I think, is exactly what Putin would do if we were to push him out of Ukraine um, and show determination and force. He would then inflict extreme unpleasantness on his own population. I mean, is it a bit dismissive to say that that he that Putin and Russia is very much like a bully, like a school bully in in that it would take advantage of the weak? It's almost a yeah. Darwinian survival of the fittest in a very like horrible way. And yeah, I'm very strong when you're very weak. But actually, when someone challenges that bully, it's like, oh, I'm not used to that. Don't really actually, yeah. There's there's two strategies, and that is a key part of it. I think this is this comes across uh, very strongly when you you listen to Keir Giles and others. One is that there's absolutely that bully mentality, and it uh, it comes back to the individual trauma that people will have suffered all the way through over generations. Um, you know, humiliation is is an incredibly important word to understand Russia. So is envy. Envy and humiliation will explain an awful lot of what's going on. Um, but of course, you know, Russia seeks to exert strength in other areas. And it also seeks to make the world look and act like it acts. So just like the Soviet Union tried to propagate its version of, of communism, because that's an environment in which it could prosper and create alliances and manipulations and so on. What we see now is a... Uh, a Russia that has mafia values, and actually it deals rather well with countries that share those values. If it can actually coerce a country, and it feels that its, uh, you know, its rulers are almost like marionettes, or it's an environment in which its uh, informal power structures work. So Hungary would be a classic example. Serbia is another. Turkey, etc. When it comes across other strong men who work through those informal networks, who understand this balance of power relations, this positioning and jockeying, and realize that actually, you know, I'm dealing with someone who doesn't really respect any rules. They just respect hierarchy and power and status. Um, then they get on with those. They don't need to invade countries where they feel they have some kind of coercive control or can create a partnership. It's only with our rules-based system Putin very early on understood that uh, he was never going to be part of the club. We tried quite hard, actually, to mm. get him to be part of the club. and uh... Which I, in hindsight, I think is very easy to criticise. But in hindsight, that Merkel, Angela Merkel approach to getting uh, Russia on side and changing them by osmosis and by globalisation, I've, I've always said that that's an admirable approach. Because do you know what? If that had worked, we'd be looking back and saying, well, look how successful we were. And so it didn't work but, because yeah. actually Putin just went the other way. But it, I, I, Yeah, but would it ever have worked? I mean, well, the, I don't argument, know. Well, yeah, no. well, the answer is not. no. With Putin, um, I would argue that that would probably not work. At the same time where they were chairing the G8, and this is uh, very ably pointed out by uh, the diplomat that I was talking to uh, just yesterday. At the same time Russia was chairing the G8, it was planning the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko in parallel at yeah. the same time. Yeah. So I don't think there was any real possibility of a character like Putin um, really bowing before or integrating with the rules-based order because the entire nature of the regime, the vertical extractive parasitic nature of the regime would have had to be completely re-engineered uh, from the ground up in order to integrate with our societies. It's it's almost, you know, it's like the kid's toy when you're trying to put the, the, the square peg in the round hole. It just, it was never going to fit. And in some ways, I feel it was always going to lead to something like this. Now, if Putin hadn't received such abysmal information, if he hadn't surrounded himself with toadies and lickspittles, and if COVID hadn't happened and really driven him down into a bunker to mm. read all sorts of absurd historical uh, fantasy mythology, and if there were just some voices tolerated uh, around him that would give an alternative point of view, which pre-COVID, it has been said that there were far more 
people able to give him an alternative version of reality. So we have an extraordinary um, series of events. Um, one also must remember that Navalny was increasing in terms of the perceived threat that he posed to the regime. Um, so there are any number of alternative scenarios where there's no real opposition, um, where COVID didn't happen, where Putin is given better information and decides that actually invading Ukraine is too risky and goes for a much more incremental approach or decides that Central Asia is a much better way to go. There are alternative ways in which this could have happened, but they all result in some form of attempt to reconstruct Russia's imperial land empire yeah. and some form of projection of aggression because um, that's the business model. The business model is fundamentally parasitic. Yeah, I mean, Kaz here says, we tried to get Stalin to be part of the club too. Merkel was wrong. It was a wrong approach with someone like Hitler or Stalin or Mao. And my point would be that at that time, though, Putin wasn't seen as a Hitler or Stalin or Mao. He was actually seen, some people thought he was going to go down a little more well, comparatively liberal way and and there were the the there was this hope that that he really could have been someone other than he was it what it didn't happen and yeah. in hindsight yeah it, it was wrong but I, I i don't i don't knock people for trying that because the other option is complete isolationism and then an ongoing sort of cold war um, well uh, you you could say that strategically it's not too smart and by all means try it but don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't yeah, deconstruct yeah, yeah, your entire military infrastructure. I mean, a great example is the chance that we had um, in Europe and the UK to build LNG terminals. So, okay, yeah. it's a real strategic risk. Let's let's create an alternative energy supply just to balance it. You know, by all means. Yeah, I mean, that. this is just that's... a generally good good. Yeah good common sense approach, which is don't put all your eggs in one basket, no matter what it is, like just a bit of diversification. Yeah, and, and work down your entire military industrial base plus your military uh, so you can't even, uh, you know, re-kit yourself as and when required. So there's an extreme myopia, an extreme lack of strategic thinking, and let's face it, an extreme greed, because it was in our interests to believe that Russia could be this partner for peace it's not that we were doing out of of uh, you know pure benevolence and idealism it was massively profitable to do that and believe it so any voices that pop and say well hang on a second isn't this really dangerous well no you're going to be shouted down because you're you're threatening a vast vast amount of money that is pouring into the ruling elites and the ruling classes yeah. now if anyone would listen to Keir Charles if anyone would listen to Luke Harding if anyone would listen to Edward Lucas who was saying this sort of stuff right from the start going back to sort of 2003 mm. you have got a much more cautious approach and strategy but no that's not uh, you know it, it's just I our own laziness I read uh, Luke Harding's book on uh, on the Ukraine war. Actually, it's good or listen to it. Um, look, as we sort of, uh, I guess, skip hand in hand through the the meadows of YouTube towards the tree line uh, on the horizon, um, I, I did want to talk, continue a little bit about um, about this appeasement idea and i'm particularly worried i had a little bit of a semi rant this morning in one of my videos because as as disturbed i am about the prospect of you know a november 2024 trumpian future and i don't want to go down that that route at the moment but i am i'm almost more worried about the mep elections so the european elections coming up in june of this year because i think europe is is in a very vulnerable position whereby the Russian disinformation can amplify the voices of the far right that it has already successfully whipped up. And we have seen a, a lurch to the right in in Europe. And I am really worried. And I did the analogy because I, Ukraine Latest, which is a Daily Telegraph podcast, had a whole section on this yesterday. And they, they went through a, a number of the different quotes from some of these far-right leaders and the Belgian far-right leader or leader of the, the Nationalist Party there was talking about actually Putin is the bad guy and this is not cool and it's like okay good position yeah I'm with you there and then he says but if we want peace we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine anymore with with weapons and, and it's like my analogy is like what are you doing that's like saying that woman that old woman across the, across the street is being beaten up by a, a thug and having her handbag snatched 
and being beaten to the ground. I agree that that's terribly wrong. But if we want peace here, then we just need to sit back and watch the thug do the things, uh, beat her up, leave her in a pulp on the ground, take the money. And then afterwards, we're not even going to sanction that. So this is what they're advocating, which is not sanctioning Russia. It's like, so we just let that happen. So I, I, I just can't believe this appeasement strategy that is espoused predominantly from the from the far right nationalist movement within Europe. And if, if, if sorry, I know this is long, but if Putin succeeds in whipping up that that discontent in Europe and gets a far right movement to gain um, more and more seats in the European Parliament, we might see the disunity of, of the EU and a lack of support for Ukraine going forward. And I'm definitely, sure. definitely. Well, we also have the same kind of stuff on the far left. It's just that we're in this political phase, aren't we, where things have systemically moved towards the right and the the Overton window that you mentioned of normalization of certain narratives have definitely shifted right. So you, you get this stuff on the left and the right, the hard left and the hard right, um, to use those labels. Putin will be seeding useful idiots, agents, and will be seeding money into various organizations to make sure these messages come across and are amplified. That absolutely happens. It's just, uh, okay. <laughs> it's just that um so that made me made me laugh that one um it's just that the right is in the ascendancy um well i think so will... I've, I've talked about this sorry to interrupt but the, like the far right is much more useful to be whipped up because in europe it's about using immigration as a vehicle to really um really pull europe apart because that is a uh, you know, a genuine issue that European countries are suffering for all sorts of different, really, not suffering, but but there is a challenge for all the European countries. And actually, I don't think that's the same for the far left that is for the far right. And I think, I think the Kremlin realizes that, and they are absolutely weaponizing immigration against the EU unity. Definitely fumbling with a mute button there. Um, yes, and you know, it, of course, they're going to invest money in whoever is going to have an impact, but they're also going to hedge their bets. I mean, mm. how could they ever predict that uh, Donald Trump would ascend to the presidency? That must have been an incredibly long shot. You know, you put your money on uh, whatever it is, an incredibly low odds thing in a casino. Um, sure, someone could put it in the notes there. Even um, he was surprised. You, yeah, you don't expect that to kind of come off. But when it does, you know, you, and, um, but you're also able to weaponize all sorts of things. So... You may not, and this was the point I think made uh, by Joseph Lindsley in the video that's coming out in just a couple of minutes. You know, they may not have substantially altered the 2016 election because they simply may not have had the resources to substantially alter the the actual voting pattern. They likely did not have a significant influence on the actual voting for Brexit. But sometimes you can actually make far more traction by claiming that you did and then setting your target country against each other. And that's what they've very capably done uh, in Brexit uh, and even more capably done by weaponizing the US media to make it, you know, to convince many in the center uh, and towards the left that Putin was, uh, not Putin, that Trump was 100%, you know, controlled by Putin. That's unlikely to ever have been the case. Um, and therefore, you're able, think of it in economic terms, if you've got a marketing budget, you know, you, you are achieving an extraordinary result because you're weaponizing a thing that didn't happen rather than actually forcing tons of money out there to try and make something actually happen. So there's very sort of clever techniques they're able to use and manipulate here. And we should watch out for those. So we may get Russia creating the hints that they have uh, hugely meddled in the European election because what they want to discredit is, you know, they want to discredit different parties within the population, set them against each other. They want to discredit the very concept of elections and make them seem invalid. So even if they haven't been able to move the dial, they'll want people to believe they have. They'll want people to believe that the vote is, uh, you know, does does not stand, um, is 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 violated, um, and uh, and and you know the the apathy and the loss of energy and the loss of will and belief and trust that comes along with that. This is where they're exceptionally capable.
they, they capitalize on any discord, disunity, confusion. And so even if they don't do something, as you say, if people think they do and if there's arguments, they just sit back and eat the popcorn. And, and you know, they are they are the winners at the end of the day there. I, I, I'm so worried about June um, because I'm looking at the polls across Europe. All, I, all I'm hoping is that at the moment there are some investigations into parliamentarians who have had some connections to the Kremlin. And the Czech and Polish reports that just came out recently from their, um, from their intelligence services. And there are other uh, politicians who have been named. There's a list that was passed on to me today. I accidentally sent that to you, actually. Uh, a list that was uh, passed me today of all the politicians who, who apparently have connections to the Kremlin. I'm hoping that if that is amplified by people fighting in the information space, by the media, responsible media sources, then you might get a pushback against the, the Russian appeasement um politicians and parties in the european elections but you know it's it's a bit of a long shot but you also have to get politicians to act like leaders i think there's a this is something else that ben said which i think is incredibly important and it's been echoed by a number of other speakers and that is there's a real craving for leadership so many people of yeah. course pin that onto donald trump they see him as a leader you or i wouldn't we wouldn't see his actions being those one of a responsible leader but there are many people who are craving leadership and they're mm. willing to put their votes and trust in somebody who speaks kind of loud and acts like a leader or how they think a leader is supposed to act but what we need is genuine leadership so i think if people were to stand up and say well this is why ukraine is important this is why we need to you know however many pounds or euros of your monthly uh, taxes are going to need to go to this and we're going to have to forego that going to other programs and so on and dig deep into our pockets but this is why and this is because it will cost you more in the long term if they actually acted in a leadership fashion made that case and took decisive and bold steps which at some point result in actual victories that goes back to our earlier comment that then is amplified in the media with more balanced reporting and the yeah. media very much takes its cue from politicians so if politicians will explain it then i think we'll see better media reporting um that follows along with that which um, is what i liked uh, emmanuel macron doing with that half yes. an hour where he spoke to those uh, people precisely those interviews precisely to communicate to the general public what the hell is going on and why he's making these decisions at years why aren't all these are why aren't other leaders doing that well done macron I, I think, you know, it, this is if we can convince them somehow that there is electoral advantage in doing this, and this is why it's so important that Macron has broke cover and, and done this. Um, you know, the Baltics and the Nordics have been doing this for a long time, so it's not particularly novel there. We, we've had politicians in Finland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, who've, who've been sort of acting this way for some time now. We need Central Europe and other countries to do it. What if, however, and here's the big prize, what if we can convince Biden that this electoral advantage into behaving like a leader? I mean, what's he got to lose at mm. the age of 80? What's he got mm. to lose at this point except US democracy and Trump? By playing it safe, by playing the cautious middle ground, um, he is not going to win over any Trump voters or even the, those who run decided is that is that the system means that he's a, a lame duck because he doesn't have the house of representatives you need a trifecta to say because the president can only enact what what gets passed through you know unless it's a particular type of thing is it's only what gets passed through um through congress and if he doesn't control congress which is why it's really interesting if there is just one or two more republicans who resign in the house of representatives and suddenly it switches back to being a democrat-led house and and uh, just by point of fact that it's more practically um e easy for bills to get passed yes you have to do two things three things i think one is you have to uh, convince them that there's electoral advantage in changing their stance. Two, you have to perhaps convince them that there is financial advantage in doing that, because yeah. we know in American politics, money goes where, uh, yeah, the opinions go where, where the money is. Thirdly, I think we should count on the idea that there is some still concept of honour, and politicians may be voting with the herd, they may be suppressing uh, ideas that what they're doing is immoral and justify it in certain ways. So that's where I think we come in. We need to demonstrate why it is dishonorable to behave in that way. 
why history will look badly upon them, why it's shameful, and why they are trashing their own moral values. That won't work on all of them, but I think that will work on some. I know a friend of mine is busy uh, forwarding Silicon Curtain on to uh, uh, Republicans that might be wobbling right now, because this concept of appealing to their sense of honor to say, okay, you've you've gone along with the, um, you know, with circus up until now, but you've really got to examine your conscience from this point on. And here are the facts. Here are the reasons why you need to do that. I, I'm about two thirds of the way through, three quarters of the way through uh, um, Liz Cheney's book, Oath and Honour, which talks exactly about that. And that is quite depressing because, unfortunately, the oath and the honour seems to have bypassed many people uh, it shouldn't have done. Uh, anyway, that, yeah. that's a whole other sidebar. All you need um, is two or three, then. You just need two or three to wobble, and then you're you're done. Yeah. So as as we uh, break hands with each other and approach the edge of that that beautiful YouTube meadow that we've been in, um, and you are approaching the style, uh, getting your muddy boot on it, um, let me know what you are most worried about going forward with regards to this war, uh, before then most hopeful. I mean, most worried. If you take the most extreme example, um, I think uh, the kind of hesitancy, the lack of clear strategy, and indeed, if it is a strategy, the the idea of trying to balance Ukrainian strength or reduce it to, to match Russian weakness, I think this could easily, eventually lead to World War Three. I think that's where we are at this point. Um, because Putin has created a system and a regime that relies on perpetual warfare. Um, there, are, there are some area experts who argue that's not the case, but I think he has banked everything on creating okay. a system of bread and circuses. There are people getting rich off it. They're going to keep him in power. They're the kind of new boyars, and there are people who are going to resist him. They're going to be sent to the front, which is the new gulag, Donetsk and the Southern Front is the new gulag. He will mm. just burn people up there if they resist him. So he's created a system yeah. which is actually stable. He's got a huge internal security force. Um, he's got a way of eliminating opponents. He's got an economic machine. He's found loopholes in all the sanctions. We're not willing to plug those gaps. He's got a certain stability in the system, but it's entirely dependent on perpetual aggression. That will continue, and that will eventually reach uh, European borders and consume European countries. At that point, we're all involved. More, we're all more involved. I mean, I think we. Yeah, I've 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 said for some time that I think we we are in World War Three at the moment. We just a lot of us don't realise it, but I, I I think we're we're in it in there to, to diff different degrees and in different contexts such as information war cyber war um but there, there is like I, I get frustrated that that uh, the Czechs announced today that the uh, european rail system is being hacked by attacked by the russians and you're like well that's war like if they dropped bombs on railway infrastructure we'd be like that's desp despicable let's <laughs> let's go to war with russia but instead of doing that they attack it the it infrastructure which has functionally the same effect and we're like oh it's russian cyber attacking us again well i know war. you talked about uh havana syndrome and there are there are some people who say well hang on a second that's just a made-up media thing it seems like a very credible story vlad vector's done a really interesting analysis of it saying that you know it's a solid piece of reporting and there is good reason to believe that that is that it's a possibility at least that havana syndrome was an aggressive uh, form of uh uh, uh, how you call it, sort of pulse energy uh, weapons being used against State Department officials, but not just against any officials. It was officials who had some background in dealing with Russia. It was officials who refused to be coerced or bribed or cajoled into neutrality or supporting Russia. And this is their way, like a mafia regime of... Uh, Taking taking vengeance because many of these officials had moved on to other roles, were no longer involved in uh, anything to do with Russia. So, when confronted with that kind of aggressive mafia behaviour, combined with the uh, neo-colonial imperialism of the nineteenth century, and let's face it, this is the last European colonial empire, and 
they're absolutely behaving like one. So it's it's extraordinary why countries like South Africa and those in the global south and others. Now that's a broad brush term because there are some who don't go along with that, but it's extraordinary why they don't see this for what it is. Uh, it's the most extreme, brutal, inefficient form of European colonialism. And it's a vestige of the 19th century, which needs to die. Russia needs to end as a colonial concept. Its people need to bury that idea and mourn it and move on. And unfortunately, until that happens, we are going to be faced with a terrible and ever-burning conflagration on the edges of Europe. And there's there's a whole conversation to be had there about what everyday Russians think their idea of Russia is, like perceptions of Russia, which is that that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down um, you i'm sure have a, a great deal to say about that okay we'll leave us then on the positives mate so what so that's what's worrying you <laughs> impending world war three and the fact that it's all <laughs> everything that we know is just about to come to an end no uh, what so what 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 are you hopeful about and what what do you think we can we can be uh, not happy about but we can look forward to taking place the the positive must be Ukraine in all of this, and for those who've come to immerse themselves in Ukrainian and speak to get to know Ukrainians over this period, or even visit the country as, as you and I have done uh, in in the last year, um, it's been a revelation to find that here's a country that has actually uh, innovated something. Um, oh, is it? Not all Republicans are the same, absolutely not. And, and my channel is 30% US uh, audience and many of those are Republicans. So I know yeah. not everyone's, you know, yeah, tired of the same, same brush there. Um, but the positivities are that Ukraine is extraordinarily resilient, um, extraordinarily innovative. And despite uh, it being withheld the foreign munitions that it needs, it is innovating some of those capabilities itself. Um, yeah. So I feel that Ukraine will not be overrun. I feel it's almost impossible or inconceivable that Russia will be able to take a city like Kharkiv. Uh, just the amount of logistics, planning, munitions yeah. and skill that would require. I agree. Uh, it just seems highly improbable that would happen, even if Ukrainians, you know, are left with basic weaponry. The street to street fighting would just be a, you know, it would it would make Bakhmut look like a like a sort of kindergarten, um, you know, playground, as it were. It would be extreme. Uh, so I don't see that happening. But I, what I do see them doing is to continue the terroristic actions against the energy supplies and so on. But I do not see Ukraine giving in or being defeated. But, you know, it comes at a terrible cost, not giving them what they need. Yeah, yeah. And I, like, again, he, this is an opportunity, if we had another half an hour to talk about the the, the rumours that NATO are talking about giving Article 5 to Ukraine. I don't know if you've heard this today, but there's potential. So there's a rumour that they are talking unofficially in, in NATO about giving Ukraine accession to, the, to NATO and Article 5 in uh it, it, um, in exchange for Russia getting what they've got now. So, like, Russia get to keep Crimea, all the occupied territories that they have, but then Ukraine get Article 5, so Russia cannot get any more. And it's like, mm. I, I, I'm not a fan of that, but I can see why some people might think that that's the solution. Yes. I mean, I, I, I there's two problems there. One is I don't see Ukrainians really liking that option and i don't see i don't see that satisfying putin because this is a slightly more sophisticated version but it's a version nonetheless of i would call it a sort of almost an appeasement narrative yeah, that yeah. goes back to the start of the war there are many old codgery diplomats that i saw at various events at chatham house and so on saying well why don't we just give them crimea and they'll be happy with that we've seen that we've been here before you know hitler was not satisfied with the rhineland was not satisfied with Czechoslovakia, was not satisfied with Poland. I mean, this is where we're at. And I think to, um, of course, the media, of course, politicians and even others, analysts will try to normalize the situation, but it is it is not normal. And we're not dealing with someone who plays by our rules. So it's a nice idea. I don't think it will work. If, however, we gave Article 5 to the unoccupied territories of Ukraine with no strings attached, put NATO boots on the ground, gave them all the ammunition they needed and told Russia to go take a hike, that would work. 
That would definitely work. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's a whole other conversation again. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it's just the appeasement, that, uh, appeasement approach is so frustrating that it's still, that it's still uh, advocated by so many people. Uh, it's like Sudetenland 2.0, and it's really bloody frustrating. Uh, well, look, let's let I'm just I need to do a couple of of thanks again. Uh, and interesting to say uh, to Ozzy Bugger again. So this war covers such a broad range of things. I've been learning more about the US internal political workings with the EU elections. I'll probably learn more about internal EU, EU politics. You guys will know that my videos have been getting quite long recently because there's so much going on. And and it's the idea that this war is global. You might not call it a world war, but it, the 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 influences on the war and the war's influences on the globe are global, and it's very difficult to talk about Ukraine and Russia in isolation of any anything else. And it, the more we learn about this, the more evident that is. And and unfortunately, it means I have to report on so much more stuff. But um, anyway, Joko, thank you so much, Slava Ukraine, Hurum Slava. Uh, thank you, matey. Really appreciate that uh, from Joko. And Johnny Christensen, thank you for your super sticker. Look, Sweden, it, uh, there's a lot of Nordic love in, in the house tonight. Uh, Joko again, uh, Crimea beach party at my garden, barbecue and beer. I don't know that I'm going to, no, I don't think I'm going to make it tonight, but I really appreciate the offer. Thank you, Joko. Uh, Brian Ivey, such a great supporter. Indeed, a Republican who is, I think, frustrated at some of the shenanigans going on. For, he would see it from both sides of, of the aisle. And uh, thank you for your support, Brian. I really do appreciate it. As I said to him this morning, every time I, I think about Republican stuff and think about talking about it on my channel, I always think about Brian <laughs> and like... How is he going to react to this? Am I going to annoy him too much by by my proclamations? But you you go through that frustration as well, I'm sure, with with you know having a, a wide broad church in in who views your channel too. Definitely, definitely, and it refines the thinking as well, rather than just coming out with like you know blah 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 statements. It makes you uh, come out with uh, you know you have to justify what you're saying and uh, to retain the audience. It sharpens our uh, rhetoric. That that's true. You you end up saying right. I would normally just give that intuitive political um, opinion that is based on where I'm at. But of course, if I'm going to try and convince someone who's on the up, opposite side of the fence to me, I need to then actually back that up with a lot better justification than just my moral intu and political intuition. So yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, look, what what are your uh, final words for today? What 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 other than everyone needs to go and check out Silicon Curtain odds? Um, what would I say? Well, definitely watch the uh, Ben Hodges video because that's heading towards the half a million. That's a record for my channel, which is fantastic. Uh, but also the content is really strong there. What he says there. But um, no, I think the last the last one has to be don't feel. Uh, depressed, don't feel helpless. Um, and these are the words of one of my speakers recently, a guy called Denis Zaharov, who's uh, a very eccentric character in Moscow, um, who is doing all sorts of activism work. He's incredibly sweary and loud and alternative. Not everyone's cup of tea, um, but he's a, he's, he's, a, he's a pretty extraordinary character taking an incredible risk in saying these things and doing these things in Russia. And he just said, look, don't feel down, do something. Taking action is the best remedy to feeling helpless and depressed by the current situation. And, uh, you know, sitting in a comfortable um, house in, in Oxford, it doesn't take a huge amount of will to, to take action and put that into practice. He's doing it in extraordinary circumstances. So I, I just find that idea of taking action uh, inspiring. And of course, it's extremely Ukrainian. It's what many millions of Ukrainians are doing as well. They're not sitting down. Well, many are in, in, in terrible trauma and shock, but many are uh, dealing with that by going out and doing stuff. And it makes a difference. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, for your opinions today. They've been absolutely fascinating as ever. If people want more of what you've just heard, please go on to Silicon Curtain and watch my interview uh, with him because if he doesn't get more hits on that, he won't have me back on. And then I'll cry into my uh, into my 
cup of tea that I'll be drinking, no doubt. Not at um, all. You're one of the regulars there. I mean, that's <laughs> not uh, going to change. Um, but no, uh, thank you so much. People seem to have uh, been having a, a lively time in the chat. So thank you to those in the live chat. And thank you for your appreciation of the Jonathans together. Um, uh, there was a talk about what is the collective noun for a group of Jonathans. I think it should be a legend of Jonathans, but that's a bit self-aggrandizing. So, but I'm going to go with it. And, and if I just press stop now, no one can argue. So, I think an inebriation of Jonathan. <laughs> there, that's right. Oh, I like that even better because uh, I think I might go away and have have myself a Friday night beer now. Uh, I think it's been well deserved. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you to everyone else. And uh, please just take on board what Jonathan has said. You know, get angry and do something about it. Contact people, spread the word, speak to people who 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 are having erroneous opinions at the water cooler, at your dinner table, with your family, with your friends at the pub. You know, be confident enough to to speak your mind and stand up for what is good and right and, and proper in the world and the, the freedom and liberty that I think Ukraine are fighting for. In the meantime, uh, take care, everybody, and toodle pips. <laughs>